Welcome. Welcome to the third Getty Graduate Symposium, day two. I'm Mary Miller, the director of the GRI, the Getty Research Institute. We won't have a formal introduction today, um, but I am so pleased to see so many people back and to uh, welcome you to what I think will be another stimulating conversation. Here to take us um, to that point is Rebecca Peabody, uh, <clears throat> who has brought all of you together. I think many people on the screen know Rebecca, and I now turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and welcome back to the Getty Graduate Symposium. If you're joining us for the first time today, I'm Rebecca Peabody, Head of Research Projects and Academic Outreach at the Getty Research Institute. And we are now heading into the second session and second day of our symposium. Yesterday's slate of excellent talks raised a number of interesting issues. I was particularly struck by the idea of liminal sensibilities. That's a phrase I'm borrowing from Leslie Carolina Gusen Robledo that was echoed for me when Christine Magnolo talked about resistance to paradigms and Lyndon Hill discussed the evasion of classification. With liminality positioned as something one might strive for as a place of resistance or of evasion, I found myself thinking about the utility of liminal sensibilities as both an artistic strategy that we saw employed by artists and in the artworks we discussed yesterday, and as a scholarly approach, a theoretical framework employed by our speakers. Our moderator, Nancy Troy, led us to a great discussion that brought up additional issues around the body, materiality, and the role of personal scholarly investment in one's subjects. And I'm eager to see if some of those threads connect with our papers today, as well as what new issues today's talks raise for us. A couple of quick notes and reminders before we get started. Please do feel free to submit questions for the speakers via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any point during the individual talks or during the discussion. There will be a time at the end of the session for our moderator to bring them up for our speakers. I also wanted to note that we've had a couple of changes in lineup since the program was finalized. Jason Weems will be the faculty sponsor for our first speaker today, and William Tronza will be the faculty sponsor for our second speaker. I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Carlotta Falzon Robinson, along with her faculty sponsor, Jason Weems, both of whom are joining us from the University of California at Riverside. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, hello to everyone. Everyone I, I can't in fact see, but, but I know that you're there. Um, I'm Jason Weems. I'm professor and chair of art history at the University of California, Riverside. And I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted uh, um, that, to have our program participate in the third, annual, the third annual iteration of this event, both for what it does, I think, um, and what it offers to our graduate students, all of our graduate students, and also especially in this year um, for offering us the chance to come together um, at a time when we're so desperately housebound. With that, I'm even more delighted to introduce um, the UCR student representative speaker at the conference for today, who is Carlotta Falzone Robinson. Now Carlotta, as you would surmise, is a doctoral candidate in the history of art at UC Riverside. Her interdisciplinary research focuses on how global and pre-industrial artistic influences shaped 19th century British design. Her dissertation, Archibald Knox and Celtic Modernism, examines the Manx artist who lived from 1864 to 1933, really sort of in the fullness of what we might call the artistic modern moment, and operated produced design and art within the context of the 19th century British design reform, antiquarianism, consumerist, Celtic nationalist, World War II remembrance, and modernist movements. So he's quite a player, I think, quite a polymath as so many um, designers were. Carlotta's research, um, which is outstanding, has been partially funded by the Paul Mellon Center for Study of, of British Art at Yale, and also the Center for Ideas um, and of, for Ideas in Society, our sort of homegrown humanity center at UC Riverside. Um, I would simply say as an addition and on a more personal note that we have a young PhD program. Carlotta was one of our first students and she has been fierce, fierce in her scholarship, fierce in her teaching and TAing, um, fierce in sort of leading us, I think, to the, to the sort of 
the best program possible. Sometimes I think we've learned as much from her as she has from us. So without further ado, Carlotta, thank you all. Thank you, Professor Weems. And thank everybody for um, the Getty for inviting me this afternoon. Today I'll be discussing one portion of my dissertation research, which is Archibald Knox's Book of Remembrance. At the end of the 19th century, Britain's counterpart to the sinuous arabesques of French Art Nouveau was Liberty Style, an aesthetic characterized by its simplicity in form and ornament. Although coined the new art by British writers of the time, the style had its roots in mid-century design reform movement, which advocated the use of pre-industrial motifs to create a distinctly British national style. The preeminent designer of this new aesthetic was Archibald Knox, who worked anonymously for the trendsetting realtor, Liberty of London. Born on the Isle of Man and steeped in the Celtic traditions of his island, Knox's style was a distinctive mix of ancient Celtic ornament and modern simplified forms in silver and pewter. While these were his best known works, these objects represent only 12 years of Knox's long design career. Knox created another large body of work that remains on the Isle of Man, including grave markers, war memorials, and illuminated manuscripts. As with his Liberty objects, these works derived their ornament from the ancient standing stones on the Isle of Man, which Knox fused with contemporary forms and stylized interlace. In my dissertation, I explore Knox's importance as an artist and designer to the development of early 20th century British modern design, looking closely at his work within both British and Celtic nationalism. Through this use of Celtic ornament fused with contemporary, a contemporary design aesthetic, Knox sought a new visual idiom, one that served to use Eric Hobsbawm's term, an invented national history for the British consumers of liberty in London. Conversely, Knox also provided a national visual identity for the Isle of Man. Most of the existing scholarship on Knox is written about his London work and by collectors rather than art historians. Through examining his illuminated manuscripts on the Isle of Man in an interdisciplinary framework, I argue that Kel Knox was a Celtic modernist, not revivalist, as he's often called. Art from the Celtic revival replaces existing replicates existing ornament, and besides being a political response, it was also heavily commercial. The Celtic modernists reinterpreted and reconfigured ancient designs to form new styles of ornament, which responded to the contemporary political, social, and cultural context in which they worked. Modern's a broad term, and in this research, I use it to categorize the late 19th century response from artists and designers who rejected historicism and classical models of design. These artists responded to industrialism and mechanization rather than rejecting it, and sought new shapes and ornament, which displayed a minimalist aesthetic. With that background, I'd like to move to the object of my presentation today, Archibald Knox's Book of Remembrance, commissioned by the Douglas Secondary School on the Isle of Man. This book was one of thousands of rules of honor commissioned in Britain to commemorate World War I. Listed and cited are all the names of the students and teachers from the school who'd served in World War I. And as such, the manuscript exemplifies what Pierre Nora refers to a lieu de mémoire, a site of memory. World War I was of a scale and complexity previously unknown. And memorializing those who served was not as straightforward as in previous wars, such as the Boer War. The millions left dead on the battlefields with the repatriation of British soldiers forbidden denied traditional sites of memory and grief to the surviving loved ones. The art historian Catherine Moriarty points out in her assessment of British World War I memorials that even private commissions rarely deviated from the official or governmental symbolism and complemented rather than challenged monuments erected by institutions such as the War Graves Commission. The memorials of World War I had a complex relationship between private spaces of memory and public spaces of remembrance, where, according to Moriarty, quote, the ultimate objective was to mold and control the latter, the public space, as a specific stabilized narrative which served to unify national memory, 
Ellen Borg argues that the use of classical tradition reflected the patronage, and it would have seemed inappropriate for a memorial art to be experimental or abstract. The common attitude was that the men honored by the erection of these memorials had given their life for the living, and nothing should dishonor this ultimate sacrifice. Further, the memorials were not simply for remembrance, but contained a moral message for those who remained, to live better lives as a result of the sacrifices these men had made. On the Isle of Man, 141 memorials were constructed. The Isle had contributed a proportionally number, high number of men to the war effort. And at home, the small island housed a massive internment camp a virtual city with 25,000 mostly German internees surrounded by barbed wire. Archibald Knox worked in this camp as a mail censor for the duration of the war, which he described as hard work and depressing. Knox designed nine memorials in total for the Isle, and in 1917, the board of the Douglas Secondary School commissioned him to create the Book of Remembrance, commemorating all from the school who'd served. The book, which the high school still owns, was not completed until 1931, shortly before Knox's death. And if we looked at the images here, at first glance, you can see the manuscript cover resembles many other World War I books of resemblance, remembrance. The cover is white leather and inscribed with subtle interlocked gold crosses. And on the inside cover, it has Knox's Celtic knotwork around the corner. It was designed to sit in the front entry of this high school in this case here, which was also designed by Knox. And so this book served as a moral statement about citizenship, about the recognition of the sacrifices for those who served, both the returned and the fallen. However, as soon as you open the book, it's apparent that this manuscript goes beyond a roll of names. Knox's 81 pages have no linear borders, no neatly written columns of names, and no somber black and red ink as was typical for these memorials. And you can see the typical memorial um, with the former staff office page from Camberley. Rather, this book has the echoes of the ancient manuscripts through the knotwork. The ancient letter forms derived from the insular manuscripts like the Book of Kells, the melding of letter and knotwork into ornament. This connection with the past is what Stephen Goebel terms medieval memory, where a common response to this new type of war was to use historic ornament to situate World War I in a longer, more comprehensible history of the nation. While the cover of Knox's book is conventional, the title page of the manuscript is a dramatic flood of deep red and violet. The lettering reads Douglas Secondary School, colored in a gradient of red with purple outlines. Behind the lettering is an irregular shape, flooded with deep crimson. The notework is structural and organic at the same time. Horizontal tendrils reach across the columns of interior knotwork as if supporting them. For the cover, Knox could have used the school ship, um, the school's motif, which was a Viking ship and which appears later in the book, or the triskelion, which is the national symbol of the Isle of Man, but he chose not to. Knox's design clearly contrasts with the formality and rigidity of other books of resemblance. This page in particular feels alive. The shading and contrast provide a sense of depth, which with the undulating knotwork pulsates. On the facing page, the dedication reads, the role of the names of the old boys who served in the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, Mercantile Marine in the time of the Great War, 1914-1919. And old boys refers to the students who attended the high school. The lettering sits on a deeper solid purple background and is framed with Knox's Celtic interlace, which is colored now in a more, um, in a brighter crimson than we saw on the previous page. No longer the curved organic interlace of the first page. The knotwork here is dense and geometric. It intertwines with the text and it's very sharp and pointy on the edges. To me, this page reflects Knox's experience working in the internment camp and perhaps refers to the war in the trenches. The use of the color in the knotwork evokes an image of blood and barbed wire. <laughs> 
It contrasts with the softer colors and sinuous interlace used inside the book. And nowhere except these two pages do we see such a violent use of color. The color purple might have a particular significance as it's the traditional liturgical color worn by high Anglicans or Catholic priests for the burial of the dead. Purple replaced black as a national color of mourning when Queen Victoria died in 1901, and the streets of London were draped with purple rather than black for her funeral. As with Knox's other illuminated manuscripts, the lettering becomes ornament. In the shape of the individual letters and their intertwining with the knotwork, the distinction between text and ornament blurs. In further research, I look at this in the context of modernist artists of the time. Knox's merging of text and ornament parallels typographic explorations that were taking place in London and on the continent at this time. Inside the volume, the names are rendered in a rainbow of colors and every one of the 513 names of the former students is hand painted. They're individual pieces of art. Because of the complexity of the lettering and not work, the book forces the viewer to slow down to unravel the meaning of the text. The pages themselves are designed in sets. The facing pages work together as a unified design, complementing each other in color and composition. Each set is a unique design and color scheme. Knox's method of designing the name paid surface to each person listed in the book. Knox taught drawing at the school prior to the war, and I suggest the creation of this manuscript functioned as a play, space of reflection for Knox, where he could process the experience of the war. The 76 names of those who died during the war are separated both structurally and design, in design from those who survived, as Knox placed them on separate pages. On these names, Knox perched small birds, delicately painted in soft pastels as a means of distinguishing the fallen from the survivors. These pages are a space of repose visually. The contrast between the living and dead is achieved through the simplicity of design and the use of quiet colors for the fallen, as opposed to the brighter, more vibrantly saturated colors of other name pages. Many of Knox's name pages closely resemble his jewelry and silver designs from London through the nature of the interlace and the jewel-like colors he used. We can see on the left page, he uses a yellowish gold pigment for the letters and ornament, which resembles metal. And the spaces in many of the letters and knotwork is filled in with gradients of color, much like the enameling seen in his brooches. On another page, the resemblance to Knox's Necklaces for Liberty of London is even stronger. The overall shape is that of a necklace with a pendant of knotwork hanging at the bottom. These pages reflect the overall trend of World War I memorials in Britain and on the Isle of Man. To fashion the concept, Anna Cardin Coyne refers to as beautiful death, distancing the loss and refashioning it as sacrifice. Rather than being explicit about death and, lo death and loss, this memorial instead celebrates each name on the list as an individual worthy of delicate and intricate care. Within the book, there are eight carpet pages that vary considerably in their decoration. Carpet pages are a common feature in insular illuminated manuscripts and can be seen in famous examples such as the Book of Kells. Traditionally, these pages are symmetrical in their design and are devoid of text. The cross we see here is a pastel colored wheel head cross, a distinctly Manx form of Celtic cross, which you can see um, a, the Manx Celtic cross is in the center there. The lower end of the vertical leg of the cross takes the shape of a sword extending past the frame and then snared in the gold knotwork which borders the pointed end. This references the Ypres cross or the cross of sacrifice re recommended as a design by the British government's Imperial War Graves Commission. It was a cross frequently used in British memorials but very infrequently used in Manx memorials. On the lower left edge of the cross sit five small birds and two more perch on the left arm of the cross. Here the birds face inwards peering at the symbolic heart of the cross 
Nox uses this carpet page to equate the sacrifice of the fallen who died in the war with that of Jesus. The birds are symbolic in Christianity to remind the viewer his soul is in the hands of God and also to represent Christ's passion. This carpet page contains a cross that appears ensnared in barbed wire like knotwork. But the colors are more subtle than the barbed wire of the dedication page. The overall shape is again, roughly a form of the Celtic cross with interlace in a steely gray, which appears almost like wire around the cross itself. Knox's knot farms are unusually elongated here and uniform in their width. This reinforces the impression of wire and the strong vertical lines look like prison bars. Like the dedication page of this manuscript, I believe this page speaks clearly to the soldier's experience in the trenches and the feeling of entrapment symbolized by the wire. But then it's balanced by small heart shapes, perhaps indicating hope. Like all war memorials, the Book of Remembrance served complex levels of memory with its unique design. Knox used color to evoke particular emotions throughout and forced the, the viewer to take time reading the book with his complicated calligraphy. The mass casualties of World War I are balanced with the care taken, create, care taken creating the individual names. His use of knotwork was derived from the standing stones, giving a, the Manx a very personal book. The recording of the individual names functioned in a traditional manner as a site of remembrance for families and staff of the school. And the location of the book in the main entry of the school teaches future generations of students the ideals of honor sacrifice and performing one's moral duty for the country. And finally, his use of that Manx ornament places the losses of World War I in a longer history of the Isle of Man. Knox's Book of Remembrance reimagines this particular form of war memorial, using modern Celtic, a modern Celtic aesthetic to create a lieu de memoir, a site of memory for a modern form of war. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rebecca, and also to the Getty. It's very nice to be here. I'm glad we can still get together under these rather difficult circumstances. It's also my pleasure to introduce Mariana Hofanisian, a curator with an international profile and an extraordinary set of linguistic skills to support it, as well as an esteemed candidate for the PhD in the Visual Arts Department at UC San Diego. The recipient of grants and fellowships, she has published articles in journals both here and abroad including as well the Rutledge series, Studies in Archives. She is currently at work on her dissertation based on research at the State Museum of Oriental Art in Moscow and the Russian Museum of Ethnography in St. Petersburg. The dissertation will focus on the archive at the convergence of the politics of metadata and post-colonial theory with reference to Armenia specifically. This dire direction was pre also prefigured in the 2016 exhibition she curated at the SALT Cultural Center in Istanbul, which brought to light the heretofore lost natural science collection of the Museum of Anatolia College and the legacy of its curator, a survivor of the Armenian genocide, Professor jo Joachim um, Manisegian. I should also say that Mariana is currently a member of the research, a research project entitled The Museum in a Liminal State, based at the Center for Experimental Museology in Moscow. This afternoon, she will speak about archives and museology in a talk entitled Ethnographic Metadata, Archives and Museums of Avant-Garde. Welcome, Mariana. 
Thank you for the introduction and thank you for this amazing event. I will share my screen and start. Okay, so this talk uh, draws upon my dissertation project, which introduces an interdisciplinary reading of archival studies, curatorial work and artistic practice based on the case studies ranging from the First World War to the mid post-war era. Taking uh, as a starting point, the post-colonial readings of archives by Beverly Butler, Anna Laura Stoller, Diana Taylor and Michelle Trulot, amongst others, my dissertation explores the ways in which the modern establishment of archives in the 20th, 20th century produces gaps in knowledge and history associated with ethno-national identities. These gaps in contemporary archival science are specifically manifested in contextual descriptions, the metadata of objects, artifacts, and records. My inquiry in metadata uh, is informed by archival science perspective. Uh, briefly, metadata is data about data. These are represented by conventional fields of title, date, name, or uh, name of creator, copyright, which introduce the contextual description and information of each archival item. Metadata ensures um, that uh, archives are searchable, reusable, and preservable for future. Interestingly, the 21st century uh, 23rd century, excuse me, mass digitization paired with the expanding accessibility, um, accessibility of archives and collection has raised new issues in the archival field. Mainly the issues concern how to ethically and accurately catalog, manage and curate records and objects. This in turn brings a new focus on the role of metadata in classification and accessibility to knowledge. The current COVID-19 situation only further emphasizes this need to imagine alternatives. But this process of digitization can become convoluted when archival standards demand a form of fixed status description that is then applied to describe the fluidity of constructs such as sex, race, ethnicity, gender, class, and nation, particularly as their existence in the archives is the result of historical and political raptures. While the professional archive intention is to provide as complete a, a description as possible, it is not unusual to find certain information is lacking, leaving the fields empty. This registers gaps of some kind within the system. In my dissertation project, these questions of gaps in metadata offer possible new openings, which may resonate uh, within the fields of artistic practice and curatorial work. I do not consider this just an exhibition engaging with archival impressions or the archival turn with the emergence uh, of visual culture. My approach to the openings aims to understand, aims to explore how gaps within the archive can aid to new understanding that gaps are more dynamic and imaginative entities which might allow ethno-national identities to emerge as a historical subjects with a radical agency. In my work, the first case study concerns archival gaps in knowledge and history, which were particularly created by the political project of an avant-garde and expressed through curatorial, ethnographic, and museological work. This case refers to the revolutionary project of the Bolshevik State Vanguard Museum policies of the 1920s, 30s, and the historical Soviet Russian artistic avant-garde from the early 1910s and 20s. Although radically different in their inspiration, both formulated a programmatic approach to ethnographic knowledge in the context of avant-garde ethos negating the past. Yet the notion of negating sight of an avant-garde paradoxically aimed at opening up the new absolute as creative energy as art critic Boris Gross proposes. Importantly, this dialectical relationship was intended to connect between museums, archives, artistic managers in a new way. In the early Soviet years, the official archive scientific institution embarked upon the revolutionary task to create history, not to write it and established new archival instructive standards and more didactic exhibition utilizing these archives. During the same period, Russian thinkers, artists proposed the notion of an avant-garde museology as a research and articulated by contemporary artists and author Arseniy Zhilev. Uh, the museums should denounce 
uh, the old orders and instead should be a live recording device and a space for experimentation, future oriented capable of transcending both physical and social limitations of humankind. For example, a 2019 large-scale exhibition called Avant-Garde List Number no. 1, curated by Lubov Chelkin at Ritikov Museum in Moscow, focused on the Museum of Poetry and Early Culture, uh, which functioned from 1919 to 1929 in Moscow. This was an experimental institution where Kandinsky, Malevich, Rochenko, Tatlin, and many others actively participated. At the museum, was intended as a, a live laboratory to, sort of, to support the human creativity and promoted the new art for the new system. The collection only included young and innovative, that is avant-garde artists, and created a system for archival inventories whose metadata data, data now engage with aesthetic attributes. This new inventory allowed to connect regional museums as a network through which to circulate the avant-garde works. The overall revolutionary project can be perceived as a force annihilating the past to promote the emergence of novel cultural forms. And yet this relied upon a radical understanding of Asian traditional and indigenous cultures articulated as folk or folklore. The Ethnography Museum formed in St. Petersburg with its official opening in 1923 provides further insights into this. In the early Soviet years, the approach to ethnography and folk and folk art allowed the state through the culture of the museum to picture the different nationalities, nations and ethnicities of the Soviet Union, either as new formations, such as new Soviet republics or pre-modern enclaves ready for modernization. As such, it can be argued that Bolshevik bureaucratic and mo modern museology proposed a new understanding of metadata that would erase the past and rewrite the different national indigenous histories. It was the accumulation of the ethnographic knowledge and folk materials that the identity construction in the Soviet Union formed what historian Francine Hirsch called a double assimilation, that is being erased while becoming something else, another. In the Ethnography Museum, manipulation of archival knowledge and accumulation of collections associated with ethnogeographies, ethno-national identities, map the ethno-characteristics of the new Soviet republics. Importantly, this process would also take place by naming pre-existing colonial and late empire-related ethnographic materials, traditional art, uh, folk, and ar even archaeological artifacts as either contemporary Soviet revolutionary or inventing new ideological constructions um, based on the scientific expedition. Hirsch argues how the process, this process had a direct connection between designing the Soviet census, maps, and museums. For example, Hirsch explains how ethnographers who had already envisioned expedition, exhibition collections of ethnographic materials were simultaneously organizing, all the, organizing the first all union census to categorize all Soviet citizens, citizens by nationality, by drawing upon ethnographic maps and reports, as well as display, displaying material evidence from the now Soviet republics. Bolshevik institution engaged in the work of border making and charting geographies of different national, ethnic and indigenous identities. Hirsch claims that this was a, an attempt to match the ideal with the real by transforming different identities into one revolutionary people, proletariat. But all of these converge with the discourse of ethnos. I find this is crucial to understand from the contemporary lens in regard to working with archives and collection dealing with ethno-national identities. In this Soviet project, ethnos was to be freed of belonging and instead aligned to threat, cultural, linguistic, or historical, in the service of one unified people. In other words, while ethno ethnos was freed from belonging, the foundation of the totalitarian state were established on charting the geographies and lands of those whose belonging and past were erased and transformed. Furthermore, in this ideological framework, the curatorial museo archival work as knowledge production practice gained a strong bureaucratic dimension. Identity subjects, epistemologies were homogenized and applied to fixed standards in archives, such as Uzbek is a Central Asian, a Jordan is a Caucasian and so on. But folk was also perceived by avant-garde artists as an ancient material condition surviving up to the present and thus being contemporary. It became a principal means 
through which the artists of the early avant-garde and Ru Soviet and Russian avant-garde developed a visual language adequate to modernity. For instance, excuse me, for instance, Polish, Ukrainian, Russian avant-garde pioneer Kazimir Malevich's refusal of the past called for the destruction of museum and historical monuments. This call adheres to, to his 1915 approach to the essence of painting, color, and texture. For Malevich, art should have the capacity to transcend the subject matter over narration and image, as the painterly creation has always been killed by the subject, such as in the case of the realist painting with recognizable subjects. In other words, recognizable subjects should have been negated for the transformative autonomy of art. But we also know how late in Pai Malevich started, uh, became concerned with Russian icon or broadsheet Lubok, whereby he was motivated by the visual sphere through social concern in peasant subject and culture. This perspective was shared with his group of artists such as Natalia Gancharova and Mikhail Larionov, who drew upon cubism and futurists to experiment with traditional folk art in order to propose a distinctly Russian avant-garde neo-primitivism. As art historian Jen Sharp argues, Gancharova, as opposed to Malevich, was more interested in national identity. Uh, Gancharova finds her source of inspiration in the folk art of the East, so to say, in the Orient of Russia, the East of the East of the West, that were ultimately ethnogeographic others, Caucasian, Central Asian, Siberian, and so on. The ongoing scholarship of art historian John Bolt explains this engagement in greater and critical details. Gancharova writes in 19, 1913, quote, for me, the East means the creation of new forums and expanding and deepening of the problems of color. This will help me to express contemporaneity, its living beauty, better and more vividly. I aspire towards nationality and the East, not to narrow the problems of art, but on the contrary, to make it all embracing and universal, unquote. Sharp suggests to see this Russian cultural orientalism not in terms of the exclusive inclusive politics of otherness, but rather how Gancharova's inquiries in icon, folk art and the broadsheet embodied diverse realization of creative practices that were able to be continued in the present through pre-modern and peasant cultures. To conclude, this negating side of avant-garde and avant-garde ethos articulated as new past, which paradoxically aimed at creating new modern culture and forms what utopian, was utopian and indeed destructive. But I want to consider that this annihilation and transformation also permanently affects archives and especially its metadata. As the early Bolshevik vanguard museum museological frameworks demonstrated, the imposition of the new system proceeds by undoing one coherent system reflecting socially intelligible relations. This annihilating withdrawal of social political meaning becomes encoded with metadata. And this could certainly be, be, be viewed in negative terms. For instance, this works as a destruction of the order of human experience by the overwhelmingly disintegrative force of modernity. But to recall the original idea of the Frankfurt School, valorizing the, uh, that disintegration, that liquidation, of a possible coherence that once came from the order of experience permits modes of critical reflections. This reconfigures the ruins of one's human experience into a new redemptive utopian akin revolutionary forms of creation and creativity. But in this destructive and transformative nature shared between avant-garde and archives, why to explore the role of folk? What kinds of openings does this offer for rethinking metadata, including the gaps within? Firstly, uh, one can suggest that the precondition of, this, of the destruction of possible coherent relations between elements is the first step of all archives, a step equivalent to the political moment of the revolution, as well as the total break with the past in the practices of historical avant-garde. Secondly, the Bolshevik curatorial vanguard practices created archival gaps in knowledge and history where folk was instrumentalized to register diverse identities as a double assimilation. Yet the initial creative impulse of the historical avant-garde viewed folk as the only surviving, resisting, and contemporary material condition capable of endorsing radical and curative openings. Thirdly, in the contemporary viewpoint, archives are the techno-utopian dreams, uh, 
due to their nature of being conceptually curated sets of bureaucratic repositories, by default archives produce uh, emissions and gaps within their historical records and art artifacts. This notion of gaps is well articulated in the scholarly work of Michel Trullio. He shows how history is a fiction, a geopolitical artifact composed of the particular bundle of silences. Trullio argues that the gaps in history work through a double operation of the silences and the, and the silencing in archives. Silences and silencing are not only embedded in the power of archival apparatus, but also in the constitutive parts of archival infrastructures, which produce, inscribe, reify, and ossify hegemonic narratives. In this sense, the gaps in metadata represent a negotiation between double silences and double assimilation, so to say between lacunas and the past which lead to their production. Thus, there is a need to critically undo them on the level of metadata describing ethno-national identities in archives. There is also a need to imagine alternatives. As my talk aims to, uh, to propose, shifting the focus on archival materials and residual fragments attributed as folk in contemporary collections might offer a new way to approach these metadata gaps. It might return us to the radical project where the category of folk is the only surviving and resisting material. And in the contemporary archival context, it is also the unresolved markers of decidedly counter utopian historical fragments of nations and ethno-national identities. In this way, such an approach might make visible the fluid construction of the imagined repressed, appropriated or misattributed epistemologies, which might allow to imagine counter strategies for arch archival metadata gaps. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce my student, Rachel Winter, who is a fourth year PhD candidate researching contemporary art from the Middle East and its relationship to globalism. Her dissertation is titled A Spectacle of Inclusion, the Rise of Contemporary Art from the Arab World, Iran and Turkey in the United States and England, 1970 to 2020 and examines the little known history of collecting contemporary art from West Asia and North Africa in the 1970s throughout the US and the UK. This project articulates the way competing modes of knowledge production across festivals, galleries, and museums acted as interlocutors for the dissemination of contemporary Middle Eastern art. She received her MA from University of Iowa um, in Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies in 2017, as well as a BA in Art History, also from University of Iowa in 2015. Rachel is also currently a curatorial intern in the Art of the Middle East Department at LACMA. Uh, Rachel, welcome. Thank you, Jenny, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here today and to the Getty for hosting this event. In the spring of 1976, there was a new world to discover in London. This world was that of Islam, and the means for discovery was the World of Islam Festival, an event held throughout Greater London from April to June 1976, comprised of exhibitions, poetry readings, Quranic recitations, public Actually, lectures. Actually, your video is not on. Or your um, PowerPoint. Thank you. The opportunity to learn about Islam was acclaimed as new and exciting, as if Islam and Islamic art were new to the city. The festival, however, had larger goals, to promote Muslim Christian unity through education, assuming that if people were more knowledgeable about Islam, tensions between religious and ethnic groups in London might dissipate. But what is the role of Islamic art in creating unity? In this paper, I reconsider one approach to achieving these social goals through an analysis of the festival's central exhibition, The Arts of Islam, hosted by the Hayward Gallery. By interrogating the way Islamic art was employed to inspire social unity, I argue that the idea of unity and diversity in Islamic art was fashioned into an attempted metaphor for British multiculturalism. Unity and diversity is a once prominent trope in Islamic art history, which suggests there is an underlying sense of unity in Islamic art informed by its religious character and repeating visual elements. Appropriating this idea of unity implied that British Christians, who were the festival's target audience, could abandon their colonial past and sidestep their Christian present towards a new multicultural future by learning from Islamic art, 
Multiculturalism was contingently constructed along religious lines, seeking mutual recognition and dialogue between Christians and Muslims to promote a new social contract. Yet as I will illuminate, their approach undermined itself through its own monolithic foundations. Islamic art intervened into 1970s Britain, a turbulent period as people became more responsive to Britain's increasingly heterogeneous social fabric. Internal conflict arose out of the fear that the British nation was being eroded, as one conservative writer asserted in light of growing immigration, first from India and Pakistan, and later from East Africa, Bangladesh, and the greater Middle East. Conversations about religion in the public sphere then became more pressing. By 1976, new restrictions made immigration more difficult, as immigrants were newly required to have a previous connection. While some British citizens perceived a greater number of Muslims in Britain, there was no actual religion category on the census to quantify this, only an ethnicity category beginning around 1970. Between 1945 and 1970, immigrants were defined as quote unquote colored, a racial designation with segregationist overtones. Rather, such perceptions were rooted in generalizations based on the relationships between ethnicity, race, and religion that simultaneously ignored the rising number of white converts to Islam that also factored into the increase of Muslims in Britain. These local dynamics played out against the backdrop of global happenings like the 1973 OPEC oil crisis, as well as the Cold War, and a nascent conservatism that would blossom under Reagan and Thatcher. The World of Islam Festival took place amidst this burgeoning Islamophobia and shifting geopolitical order. Ahmed Keeler, formerly known as Paul Keeler before converting to Islam between 1975 and 1976, conceived of the festival. A child of the British Empire raised in a Christian household, an ex-actor and an ex-gallerist, Keeler became interested in Islam in the late 1960s after meeting the Indian satirist Mahmoud Mirza, who introduced him to Mughal India. Keeler then learned of Moorish Spain, noting Islam was the connective fiber between the two. Islam not only became Keeler's faith, but in its tenets, he found a corrective to the decaying West and its aberrations of modernity that he wanted to share. To continue his independent study of Islam, he designed a show in 1971 called World of Islam to teach people about Islam through pattern and geometry in Islamic art. He left the event 10,000 pounds in debt, partially inspiring him to undertake the 1976 festival. Each institutional manifestation of knowledge about Islam was a reflection of Keeler's personal journey to the religion, as well as his beliefs both in the power of Islam to unite people and to solve the woes of Western society. Keeler's biography contributed to the multicultural metaphor. If he could turn from his British Christian upbringing to find solace in Islam, then other British Christians could do the same by turning towards a new way of life dedicated to building mutual understanding. Like in 1971, Islamic art was the primary means to reach the public, now exhibited in the Arts of Islam at the Hayward Gallery as a part of the 1976 World of Islam Festival. The Arts of Islam had specific parameters. First, organizers maintained that the show had to be curated from what they called an Islamic point of view a rubric which was never fully delineated. Second, organizers required every aspect of the festival to be overseen by an academic who was Muslim, also for reasons never enumerated. These rigid criteria implied there was a monolithic Islam and Islamic point of view that could only be shared by select people without acknowledging the diversity of lived religious experiences. Two people were responsible for implementing these frameworks. First was Basil Gray, a British art historian of Chinese art and curator at the British Museum. He was not a Muslim and his role was primarily logistics and oversight. Second was Titus Burkhardt, a Swiss convert to Islam who worked for UNESCO while living in Morocco. He was appointed advisor based on his prolific history of writing about what he saw as the spiritual dimensions of Islamic art. Choosing Burkhardt fulfilled the mandate to hire Muslim academics, yet his role foregrounds the problem of the native informant, in which one must speak for the entirety of their culture to the outsider, again implying it is a singular entity which can be comprehensively represented. More importantly, Burkhardt fulfilled the multicultural metaphor, for he, like Keeler, abandoned his European Christian upbringing for Islam, acting as a model for others to also find a new way of life. Historical predecessors also informed curatorial approaches to the arts of Islam. One interlocutor for displaying Islamic art and engaging audiences was the 1910 exhibition Masterpieces of Mohammedan Art. 
held at the Haus der Kunst in Munich, Masterpieces was thought of as the last great exhibition of Islamic art in Europe, meaning organizers wanted to put forth the next great exhibition. Featuring 3,600 objects curated as a series of period rooms, the 1910 show looked to elevate Islamic objects, which were held primarily in private European collections to the level of masterpiece as a way to promote their study in art history, thus targeting academics and collectors to see their encyclopedic efforts. Yet to return to 1976, the arts of Islam differed in important ways. The show assumed people in London lacked knowledge about Islam and planned accordingly. Rather than an encyclopedic overview, the Arts of Islam presented roughly 650 objects exemplifying what organizers deemed the essential characteristics of Islamic art, which were defined as the arabesque, the figure, calligraphy, and geometry. These four elements were thought of as uniting Islamic art under the principle of unity and diversity, which proposes that despite variations in form, style, and patronage, that Islamic art was unified by religion and aesthetic features crafting a homogenized idea of Islamic art. Unity and diversity thus framed the arts of Islam, making different objects appear cohesive and related to support their unifying ambitions. The problem with unity and diversity is that it disregards the way time and place shape Islamic art. The arts of Islam did not clarify that these four elements also vary due to cultural interaction and artistic exchange, instead constructing a unified field through repeated characteristics. Scholars like Avi Noam Shalom recently critiqued unity and diversity by arguing that the concept poses a myth of unity by crafting similarity and neglecting historical specificities, in turn appropriating similitude to amalgamate objects from different regions and times to conceptualize unity and diversity. By identifying the essential characteristics of Islamic art, this is what organizers did dismiss the particularities of cultural production in favor of a unified style and subsequently a unified civilization. In this way, much like the festival's framework purported one Islamic viewpoint, one idea of Islamic art was also set forth. Yet this symbolized the multicultural metaphor, for if different historical objects were united by shared elements, then so too could people if they looked past their differences to find the things they shared. The second interlocutor for the arts of Islam was Treasures of Tutankhamun at the British Museum in 1972, which showcased 50 objects to celebrate the 50th anniversary of discovering Tutankhamun's tomb. This was a point of national pride since a wealthy British citizen financed the dig. People flocked to the show and the queen also attended, signaling its cultural importance. From this, Keeler developed a grandiose vision. He wanted the arts of Islam to be larger than Tut, noting that, quote, if a dead man, King Tut, could have had such an impact in the West, how much more would a living culture like Islam have?" End quote. Tutankhamun also proved that historical artifacts from the Middle East, previously unseen in the West, could bring audiences to the museum like never before, something the arts of Islam was quick to note. Organizers believed the quote-unquote best objects to illustrate these essential characteristics of Islamic art were those held in collections throughout the Middle East, which were thought of as aesthetically superior. Organizers also turned to the Middle East for financial and political support. Much of the festival was funded by what organizers called Muslim governments, which were the governments of Middle Eastern countries with Muslim majority populations, many of whom profited from the 1973 OPEC oil crisis, including Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Iran. Some of these countries also previously benefited from British funds during efforts towards independence. Neither the British government nor taxpayers funded the festival. British ambassadors to Middle Eastern countries also facilitated conversations between organizers and political officials to negotiate funding and object loans. And the two Quran pages seen here from the Mashhad Shrine Library in Iran summarize this discussion. After negotiations through the British ambassador, Keeler visited Iran, the Iranians made a substantial donation, and then loans, such as this one, were made possible by the Shah's imperial decree. This collaboration added to the multicultural metaphor. If the Muslim world could cooperate with Britain for the festival, it indicated an amiable relationship, thus modeling the goodwill organizers hoped they'd inspire in the public after the festival. These historical predecessors coalesced with the present at the Arts of Islam, which showcased Islamic art from roughly 700 to 1800 across different media, 
organizers assumed the object could also convey the history of Islamic civilization and the tenets of Islam while also exemplifying the key aesthetic features. Despite wanting to show a living civilization, only historical objects were displayed. Framed by unity and diversity, the show was created as a model out of Islamic art for a multicultural Britain, as something defined by its consonances rather than its dissonances. Here's how visitors encountered Islamic art. They first entered Gallery 2, which was one of two thematically arranged rooms introducing unity and diversity and the four essential characteristics. Beginning with stuccos, carpets, and textiles, the identifiable objects are all Timurid, Safavid, and Ottoman, or from roughly the 14th to the 18th centuries, opening the show with the chronological end of Islamic art history. With limited didactics, the viewer had to ascertain for themselves what the essential characteristics were, as well as why they were significant. Visitors then moved to Gallery 3, of which there are no remaining photographs. This room held a slideshow of photographs of architecture from the Islamic world, which served two purposes. First, it contextualized objects, implying that, for example, carpets were a part of a larger aesthetic environment. And second, the slideshow projected the unity of the Islamic world by demonstrating the way shared architectural components, such as the minaret and the trefoil arch, repeated across historical monuments. Next was Gallery 1, the second of two thematic rooms. This one outlined the essential characteristics of Islamic art, which were the figure, geometry, calligraphy, and the arabesque. Their importance was reiterated by their mutability across media, as well as for different purposes, be they religious or secular. This gallery also expanded its historical parameters, ranging from the Abbasids to the Ottomans, or roughly the 9th to 18th centuries. Galleries four and five shifted to a two-room chronological survey of Islamic art, which highlighted the way these essential characteristics unified by the field are showing their ever presence. This is gallery four in the only picture of it which remains, making it difficult to comprehend the full nature of their compressed chronological survey. But several pictures remain of the fifth and final gallery, which included objects from Abbas of Baghdad to Mamluk Egypt and Ottoman Turkey, encompassing almost the entire breadth of Islamic art. The final gallery also offers interesting conclusions. It ends Islamic art history with the Ottoman Empire. By including motifs related to nature and calligraphy, it references paradise or the Islamic concept of heaven, alluding to the end of life in Islam. And finally, the Persian garden carpet echoes the one Keeler showed in 1971 when he first formulated the idea for the festival, showing the way his journey to Islam and to creating the festival came full circle. By bringing disparate objects together to represent a unified Islamic art history, this arrangement implied that Islam brought together people and empires across history, showing Islam and Islamic civilization is united and proposing Britain could be too. The Queen opened the arts of Islam, and her voice amplified the call for unity. Her opening speech rehearsed the festival's ambitions, welcoming their guests from the Islamic world whom she recognized for funding the event, while calling for, quote, the need for mutual understanding between nations, end quote. While her advocacy for unity seems governmental and external, this transnational unity was an example for coexistence among people between the Middle Eastern diaspora and domestic Britain, something parallel to the planning collaborations between Britain and the Muslim world. Although her participation was meant to be non-political, having royal encouragement to get along as set forth by the cooperation between the British and Islamic worlds was a clarion call to come together. Numerous press reviews noted the festival's desire for unity in a tumultuous era, especially as it opposed the current divisive ways of seeing the world. Yet in the wake of the Lebanese civil war and later the Iranian revolution, the grand mosque seizure in Mecca and more, the festival's utopian goals became posthumously untenable. No lasting social change resulted from the festival and enthusiasm for seeing Islamic art faded out of cultural memory. Islamic art was a conduit for bridge building between populations, yet the object did not make its intended impact, perhaps because the festival alighted the diversity necessary to fashion multiculturalism. Rather than harnessing the way Islamic civilization encompassed people of varying faiths and ethnicities, the festival omitted these multitudes and the way Islam allowed for coexistence, missing an alternative model for achieving unity. This singularity of the past was then projected into the present, 
rather than acknowledging the pluralities of lived religious experiences, such as those of a white convert to Islam and of a Muslim in diaspora, one singular historical perspective prevailed, as did one definition of Islam and Islamic point of view articulated by a select group of individuals. The World of Islam Festival excluded Muslims and diaspora from the Islamic world in all regards, paradoxically neglecting a population critical to negotiating a new social contract. The other stakeholders in this discourse, namely British Jews and Christians, were also not given a chance to respond or converse about their views on shaping a multicultural Britain. Likewise, the arts of Islam neglected cultural production by Christians, Jews, and other religious and ethnic minorities living within the historical Islamic civilization at stake, overlooking visual evidence of coexistence and tolerance throughout history. This exercise reveals the shortcomings in British society necessitating multiculturalism while repeating the inequities and distortions at hand, hindrances the historical Islamic object could not overcome. But by rethinking the social capacity of Islamic art at the festival, we can move forward to draw historical Islamic art into dialogue with contemporary art from the Middle East to understand the ways cultural production from West Asia and North Africa is continually appropriated and framed for the purpose of building bridges between populations. Thank you. Thank you, Carlotta, Mariana, and Rachel for three really interesting papers that give us so much to talk about. I'd like to invite you all back to the screen now, along with Jenny Sorkin, who will be moderating our discussion. Jenny Sorkin is Associate Professor of History of Art and Architecture at University of California, Santa Barbara. She writes on the intersections between gender, material culture, and contemporary art, working primarily on women artists and underrepresented media. She is the author of Live Form, Women, Ceramics, and Community, and the forthcoming book, Art in California. She is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Modern Craft and has been the recipient of fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Center for Craft, the Getty Research Institute, and the ACLS Loose Fellowship in American Art. In 2021-22, we are delighted that Jenny will return to the Getty as the Consortium Scholar in Residence. Welcome. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and thank you all for your wonderful papers. Um, I feel like this is definitely uh, the global panel. Uh, and I think what we could also consider um, reframing, there's usually not uh, a very good way to create a theme on a conference like this, but uh, this year there actually is. And I think that um, it's interesting that across all three panels, including the one we will see tomorrow, uh, we could think about retitling this conference, the expanded canon of the 20th century. Um, or something along those lines. There could be a better version of that, but that's the one that popped into my head listening to all of your papers and thinking back to yesterday's um, panelists as well, who were also expanding the canon um, in different directions, pushing outward um, and working against um, received histories. So I'm wondering if I could um, open with a more general question and ask each of you to respond to this idea of what the expanded canon means to you, or what does it mean to push past um, received histories and boundaries um, that you find yourselves up against um, as students of art history? And I think we could just go in order. Um, Carlotta, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to compliment my two cohorts on wonderful papers they are very interesting. Um, I certainly am working in what can be called design history, or um, which is a bit peripheral to art history in some ways. And so expanding the canon of art history to include um, consumption, to include manufacture, to um, look at some of these aspects is um, something I've been sort of wrestling with how to do, um, looking, you know, bringing in so many different disciplines. Um, it's expanding the canon of um, decorative arts, but it's also the exp opening up sort of the canon of Celtic arts, um, which is not really well studied except in for Celtic revival. And so um, that's really how I, I see it. Thank you. Mariana, would you like to respond? 
Yeah, I think uh, on the one hand, in my case, I have experienced the 90s contemporary art return to the to the kinds of post-Soviet right uh, condition, and what you see there somehow, right, uh, these kinds of the uh, the initial phase, how it has been formed, was somehow missing. So as a kind of inspiration, that has been my first motivation to understand furthermore why the identity, right, uh, and how it relates to art. But I think on the other hand, if I can kind of, you know, expand uh, uh, more, I mean, we are talking now about the decolonial kinds of decolonizing archives, collection, artistic practices, right, the knowledge structures, but at the end, we kind of constantly are dealing with genocides in Paris, colonial powers. And, and, and when you're kind of trying to explore them, if they are constantly negotiated between museum archival uh, paradigm, and that was, I think, uh, my, uh, the other kinds of aspect, like trying to look and to see where this intersection has happened and what it can tell us to the, about the contemporary. Thank you. Rachel? Thank you for that really interesting question. Um, I think the idea of expanding the canon really fits on multiple levels throughout my project. And on one hand, I think as scholars of Islamic art, we're sort of continually questioning the field and what it means to construct the field and where the field fits into this so-called canon. Um, and as sort of we redefine the field, we sort of resituate where it sits in the canon. Um, but another part of my project that I didn't have time to present on today looks at contemporary art from the Middle East. And that is very much part of this expanded canon um, in which sometimes it's put with Islamic art, sometimes it's put with sort of the global contemporary. Um, and that is, I think, a part of this canon that we're trying to expand, but I think we're still trying to figure out what the language is to articulate it and what the placement of it is within this larger narrative that we're trying to tell, um, particularly of the global as we live through it. Thank you. Um, I do have another set of questions, but I also want to remind our audience um, that you are welcomed to ask questions in the Q&A and I will read them out loud um, as well as your name. Um, we have our first question actually, so I will jump to this and then uh, perhaps save mine in case there's other um, questions from the audience. Uh, Christine, um, who presented yesterday on Norman Rockwell um, says, thank you for three engaging and mind opening presentations. I had a question for Carlotta. I know very little about the intersection between art history and the study of design. Do you find you run into challenges in finding the appropriate vocabulary and methodologies for approaching design in a way that doesn't marginalize this practice? Are there practices outside art history that have provided further guidance? Thank you for that question. Yeah, it's actually a huge, um, a huge battle to balance these. Um, if you're working, you know, from a bibliographic sense, you're bringing in typographic history and graphic design history, you're bringing in um, the history of ornament. I also have a master's degree in history, so I'm bringing in um, material cultural history in various ways and nationalism. And so, um, yeah, it's very difficult um, to figure out because material history is such a fluid um, form of, of study right now and everybody approaches it differently. And so um, using all these, you know, trying to balance all of these different influences. And I should say, there are like zero archives on Knox. So you're also doing this all from the outside in um, or looking from the object out, but you don't have anything um, from the artist himself, which makes it even more difficult. Thank you for that. Um, I did want to sort of, uh, I'll, I'll ask another question from the audience in a moment, but um, I one of the other uh, sort of ideas that we could say unifies all three papers is um, working against uh, a kind of history of revivalism. Um, that is a term that shows up um, early on in Carlotta's paper in that uh, Carlotta, you argue that Knox is a modernist, not a revivalist. Um, and yet uh, we see elements of um, Art Nouveau and British arts and crafts that comes uh, strongly into his work. We can even say that his jewelry looks really similar to Charles Rennie Mackintosh. 
um, that uh, William Morris far ahead of uh, Knox is a, a kind of, you know, aficionado of the illustrated manuscript. Um, even though this version of it, it looks very modernist, uh, certainly there's a kind of long-standing precedent with um, the Kelmscott Press. Um, and uh, in Mariana's case, um, Mariana mentions and talks about um, the revival of the ethnic uh, and the kind of promotions of the past um, as a form of folk, as a form of purity, as a, a kind of um, uh, utopianism in action. Um, I also wondered if uh, you could maybe think about how revivalism might relate to the idea of metadata, which you introduced early on, and the idea of reviving information, literally, um, in another iteration in a database. Um, and lastly, Rachel, um, you have a relationship in your paper to the revival of the ancient and maybe frozen past, the kind of idioms of uh, ancient Islamic art um, that are trotted out for a multicultural present um, that don't really nod to any kind of contemporary or modernist art production. So I just wanted to throw out across this uh, ideas of revivalism if anybody wants to respond to that. Any of you? I will certainly, I mean, I saw that thread very strongly among all three of our papers as well. Um, the Islamic, um, you know, sort of stuck in history, um, the archives, that whole idea of the primitive, you know, that's certainly um, the appeal of the Celtic to the British with the nationalism is it's this primitive other, this, this simpler life. And um, I think that revivalism definitely runs runs through all of them, you know, as it does. I mean, when you look at contemporary art history, a lot of times, you know, if you're, you're looking at other nations, you're looking at them only historically and not the contemporary art. And I think that's where you two, um, your papers are very strong because you're looking at, you know, you're, you're pointing out that, that this is historically framed, but it denies the agency of the current time and that that's certainly what Knox was battling um, this historicism. Thank you for that um, summary of, of all three papers. That was a nice synthesis. Uh, Mariana, do you want to respond at all? Um, yeah, it was really a great summary, Carlotta. Thank you. Exactly, because that is my point, right? Every time when you want to revive any archival kinds of vocabularies or searches and so on, indeed, you are either dealing with residues or dealing with uh, unclear, let's say, vocabularies that are completely, you know, not uh, rendered associative. So thus, you need to kind of exactly imagine other ways. And as you are seeing, for instance, I have revived more than 10 archives just for this 18 minutes presentation. So um, I think the first, in, in the case of the metadata, definitely what I'm recognizing, it happens through going through the registered books, through going through the kinds of the collections and so on, but recognizing how much it's not matching or you don't even know right how to look and explore so that what comes through is just uh, yeah drawing upon different fields and i find bringing back this uh, avant-garde moment of looking at the folk is quite important because it has at least for me offered new entry points of reviving reworking the metadata maybe like one day even changing certain uh, certain categories there rachel would you like to respond at all? I would. Um, I haven't actually written about the concept of revival too much in this project, but I do think it's a great point to bring up because in some ways the entire endeavor is a revival. The festival is a revival of forms that build out of the World's Fair and then evolve into festivals. Um, the exhibition is a revival based on previous exhibitions. Um, bringing back art that hasn't been seen before is in some ways trying to revive it and bring it new life by presenting it to a new audience. Um, but I think what's interesting is all of these revivals are done in the name of this historical object being used to solve contemporary problems. Um, and I would argue that that wasn't 
successful. That plan didn't necessarily work out as they thought it would, um, but it's still interesting to think about why you would look to the historical object to solve the present problem. Um, but in turn, I think the revival that was missed, which I explore later in my project, was contemporary art and the way contemporary artists from the Middle East were reviving forms such as the Arabic letter into these new creations to respond to a new moment. Um, and that particular revival was missed at the festival, which I talk about elsewhere. Great. Um, I have a question for Carlotta from um, my colleague Volker Welter, uh, who writes, thanks for your wonderful paper. Could you expand a bit on the idea of the Book of Remembrance as lieu de memoir or site of memoir? In which setting, in which setting, in what setting could such books be seen or even consulted? How does a book of remembrance as a lieu de memoir compare to sites of memories within the urban fabric that the Celtic Renaissance conceived in other parts of the British Isles? For example, the Scottish Celtic Renaissance circle around Patrick Geddes. I'm thinking here, for example, of C.R. McIntosh's design for a memorial fountain or Frank Mare's Via Sacra leading up Castle Rock in Edinburgh, designs that constitute public urban places of memory. Thank you for that. Um, there's, yeah, there's a, definitely the memorials um, are, the variety is immense. And um, this was in some ways, both a private and a, uh, um, public memorial, like the other more public memorials you mentioned. Um, this was private because it was commissioned by the school. It's shown at the school. And in fact, to get access to it, I had to jump through hoops of fire um, because it's not shown to the outside public, but it is shown to all the students. And the students actually used to be able to carry it home and study it. Um, the public monuments, of course, work more in a way of um, of making a national. Um, they're they're more for for unifying the history and memory of the war versus a personal site. Um, and the private memorials here um, are more personal. Um, also, the um, the Celticism. Knox was a Celtic revival. He actually did a pan-Celtic um, cover for the pan-Celtic. Um, and his knotwork, um, his use of some of the symbols is distinctly makes the type of cross. Um, he didn't really, um, the others, um, the other memorials were sort of separate. He didn't do any national memorials um, like public memorials like um, you were saying. And, and so Knox was in some ways a revivalist, but he didn't write about it a lot. Um, okay. And I'm not sure if that answers um, the question completely. I'm not sure either, but I, I, I would assume that that's a, an opening bid for thinking uh, more about these different kinds of um, sites. Uh, in private versus public. Um, I'm going to go to a question for Rachel from um, Diva Zumaya. Uh, how have you seen some of the essentializing assumptions that you discuss? For instance, that Islamic art is unified and univocal, um, continue or be challenged in subsequent scholarship and exhibitions on Islamic art? Thank you for that awesome question. Um, I think that this idea of unity and diversity was really prominent in the 70s, but as later scholarship has sort of told us after the 70s that that idea really died out and art historians of Islamic art largely became more focused on the specificities and particularities of cultural production. So I would say broadly now we have sort of shifted away from a lot of um, sort of univocal unified thinking about the field. Um, we see sort of some idea of unity when in certain thematic approaches, um, but I would say that more and more 
acknowledging the diversity that is a part of thinking through these themes um, and thinking about counter arguments to these themes. Um, and I would say I think that actually a really great example of how we're sort of challenging essentialist assumptions to Islamic art is the Met's more recent uh, installations of their Islamic art galleries, um, which is actually the art of Arab lands. Um, and so they're expanding their geographical and temporal parameters also allowing in other religious and ethnic minorities into their galleries in terms of cultural production, um, which gives a more sort of diverse view of the field and continues to challenge sort of the unified idea of Islamic art history that we want to move away from. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna throw out a question to Mariana. Um, in terms of uh, thinking about um, Russian, uh, nation building or ideas of Russia, Soviet empire building. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk at all about um, the Tartars or um, ideas about um, ethnic subgroups um, and how that becomes um, later revived uh, in terms of other forms of modernism. I'm thinking about particularly somebody like Joseph Boyce uh, in, in his own um, sort of uh, World War II mythic narrative of um, being wrapped in felt and fat by the Tartars and what it means um, to think about um, this uh, metadata project that you've injected here or the idea of the searchable past. Um, thank you. This is a great question. I think um, the first thing that, uh, right, I mean, the period that I'm looking until actually like um, the, the Stalin somehow comes like the late 1930s when really this gets fixed. So while what I'm looking at the ethnographic museum and uh, and uh, Oriental uh, Art Museum. So these are really like the Tartar and so on. It's very kinds of the fluid. And we see how the idea of the Central Asia and all what I was arguing is kind of based on the expedition is getting certain somehow uh, fixed. But already, uh, as my first slide was suggesting, this shamanic part, right, somehow gets so much, you know, as a as a rituals, as a kind of, as you are mentioning in the case of the boys, the, the mythic space has been picked pick up by the artists. And what is interesting, I think you see in the 90s, the, when the, the when you look at the Central Asian contemporary art, there is a re return exactly to to that kind of understanding of the uh, ethnicity through the especially among the Tartars, Uzbeks, and all like kinds of you know not to homogenize at all, but there is a return to the idea of this kind of erased self and in, in exactly embracing this mythical space, but through articulating the national identity and removing the Soviet one, and quite interestingly, it gets reenacted, for instance, in the performance art and uh, and I have seen like you know many works and I found it quite interesting it has like, like that kind of direct relation what has been somehow categorized and suppressed in the beginning of the Soviet nation building it somehow returns in the contemporary art uh, in the Central Asia and for instance if you look at the color journal and you look at the ongoing scholarship of the artists in particular coming from the Central Asia they are trying constantly to undo it through the contemporary art paradigm um, this mythical space. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to follow up with a question in the Q and A um, from Laurie Monahan. Thank you to all three of you. I enjoyed your presentations. I have a question for Rachel. Can you speak to the issue of unity as a way of skirting some of the conflicts occurring in the Middle East, especially the war in 1973 and the Six Days War, the expelling of the PLO from Jordan in 1970, etc. In particular, the UK seems strongly implicated in these events. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I think you're absolutely right that the UK has a very uh, shall I say, long history of involvement in the region. And I think as you read through the archival papers um, and sort of the documentation about how they were thinking about all of this, um, they really tend to elide that. Uh, so Keeler himself is very knowledgeable about the history of British colonialism, but after that, they try to just sort of forget about it. Um, and so their goal was very specific, was that they wanted to create unity in Britain. Um, they didn't have any sense that they were going to try and create unity in the Middle East. Um, that was in no way their plan. They had no aspirations that they would possibly do so. Um, I actually think that the conflict in the Middle East 
became involved in the festival in the sense that it created points of skepticism for uh, British Christians and Jews um, because they would see, for example, Arab success in certain conflicts and then um, others would perceive that as a way in which Arabs were going to try and take over Britain. Um, and so the the conflict in the Middle East really just became a point of skepticism. Um, also, anti-Semitism um, comes up a lot in sort of these planning documents and British Jews having a lot of questions about the festival and its position on Palestine and how it would affect the British Jewish community. Um, so I think the war in the Middle East really was more of an issue for British Christians and Jews um, trying to understand why Islam was suddenly taking center stage more so than the festival actually trying to address all of those conflicts. Thank you. Um, I have one more question um, from Kate Flint. Um, thank you to all. Here is a question for Carlotta. Can you please say more about how, how the Isle of Man's peculiar national position and its relatively forward-looking politics, its own art school at which Knox was a very early student, factors into a pan for national nation's Celticism? Is there anything specifically Manx in this design? After all, it did distinguish itself as an entity. Okay, yeah, so the Isle of Man has a very, thank you, Kate, um, has a very bizarre relationship um, with Britain. It's a crown dependency. And really the nationalism that happened at the turn of the century was multifold. And Milosevic Hruk is really the one who explains this best about nationalism in small nations. You had the aristocracy saying, oh, the, the national trends are fading and we want to revive these. You had, Manx, the Isle of Man was a tourist destination. That was like 70% of their income. And so with the culture fading, there were also um, the, the boarding house owners and tourist owners um, were interested in reviving the culture um, because of that. And then there were agitators who wanted autonomy from Britain, complete autonomy. And so you had these three strains of dissension going on. The School of Art was actually started by the um, British Lieutenant Governor's wife. And so it was a type of nationalism from the outside um, that was instigated from the outside. And at that time, there was a pan-Celtic revival and Sophia Morrison and uh, Mona Douglas these people were reviving um, the Celtic culture and Knox was illustrating the covers of their magazines and writing articles. And so he became um, part of that. And what happened though was essentially his design style, his, his type of knotwork, um, which was on gravestones around in the war memorials and other artwork he did on the island became really a, a particularly makes form of Celtic ornament and that and it still is. I mean, the cathedral still uses his, his style of knotwork for their logo. And so that's really, um, it, it's recognizable. We have very little provenance on Knox's work, but you can look at it and go, that's a Knox. Um, and it, because it's so distinct. Great, thank you. Um, I think we are actually at time. Uh, so I'm going to turn this back over to Rebecca. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Carlotta, Mariana, and Rachel for such an engaging session and to our audience for your really great questions and engagements. This does conclude our second session and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone back here tomorrow, same place, same time for our third and final session. So thank you again. And until then, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>